Good morning, Friends Church. One of our core values is blessed people give like God. My family is very blessed because of my father. He took so much effort to get to a safe place over here in America, and he's using that gift to like give people over back in Africa a better learning environment. If you have more stuff than you need and you're blessed by God, then you should give to people that need stuff and aren't as blessed. Because God gave us the ultimate gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, it is our responsibility as Christians to give the kingdom of God to others and to support the church in whatever ways we are able to. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. May God add his blessing to that word. You can be seated. We're in the series, I Love My Church, and I want you to know I love our church. I love our church because of what it stands for and what it's becoming. We want, as our vision states, to be a community that loves people to life in Jesus Christ. That's what we're about. And so over these last few weeks, as we've entered into the fall, we've been uh, rehearsing and reminding you of our church's core values. <clears throat> Uh, over the last few weeks, we've talked about our first core value, found people, find people, saved people, serve people, love people, or, or, or changing people, uh, grow within, or growing people change within. And then, of course, last week, we talked about love people, don't do life alone. I thought it was interesting this week, someone asked me, well, pastor, why is it that God puts so many difficult people into my life? And I thought, you know, that's a really great question, isn't it? But if you think about it, we need each other. And one of the things that happens when we're together is that you're a test for me. And I'm a test for you. And I grow in patience. I grow in kindness. I grow in love when we're together. And so truly, we need each other to pursue the righteousness that can only be found when we're together in Jesus Christ. So thank you again for being here and a part. But this morning, I want us to think about the fifth core value of our church, and it's simply this. Blessed people give like God. Blessed people give like God. Now, I want you to think for a moment, and maybe we can do this together. How has God blessed you? Let's, let's just take a moment. Let's, let's kind of just shout out, uh, uh, what, in what way has God blessed you? And, and shout it out so everyone can hear you. What's a way that God has blessed you? Healthy children. Children, healthy children. Family. My son's home. Amen, amen. Absolutely. We think of our family. We have friends. What else? Chris. A home. 
a warm home, a place to stay and live. Kim? Kim? Your pets, okay, we got the, we, it's a big pet Sunday today, uh, absolutely. Yes, Jerry. Good friends, honest friends, loving friends. Forgiveness, forgiveness in Christ, forgiveness that we can offer to one another. What else? Health, well, you, can't, you can't stop there, Martin. America, the United States, and, that coming from our newest citizen, yeah, absolutely. Amen, amen. Courtney, I see you back there. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely, the community that takes care of one another in spite of our differences, absolutely. I hope, but did I see another hand back there? No, 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 I see one over here. Freedom that we enjoy, the fact that we can come together this morning without being fear afraid, absolutely. Our church, amen, amen. Let's be grateful that we can come together and we've been so blessed. Yeah, come on back. Really, Phil, now that, that is surprising. <laughs> that is surprising, it's good to see that. We could do this all day. Yes, can't see. He wants to. He wants to do it right here, right now. Absolutely. And Debbie, were you going to say something? I saw your hand earlier. Yes, Debbie has a good testimony this morning that uh, she's gotten a free and clear uh, report in her lungs, and we're just praising God for that as well. So, amen. Well, Tom, yes, I want the presiding elder. He's my boss, so I need to let him have his moment. Volunteers. Volunteers. <laughs> the right thing for a presiding elder to say, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, I hope we could. We could just rehearse this all day, thinking about the way that we have been blessed. I am blessed. When I come into this place, I cannot help when I think of that cross up there, what Jesus Christ did for me. Even while I was yet a sinner... I was at enmity with God. I was a slave to sin. I was uh, in, in, in trouble for eternity. But Christ came and he gave me hope because of his death and his resurrection. I am grateful for a restoration of relationship that I can have because of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to keep that in mind this morning as I talk. Because one of the things that I've learned in ministry over these years that I've been here in this church is that the opposite of love, as we talk about loving our church, is not hate, but is apathy. It's not hate, it's apathy. It's not caring. Next month, we're going to go through a, a, an opportunity. We're going to talk about the campaign, a, a capital campaign, if you will, the Generations of Faith campaign, where we're going to talk to you about the next stage of our ministry, the next leg, and how we kind of put things together for the future of our facility and, 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 and our uh, dealing with some of our debt and looking forward to new ministries here and how we put ourselves in the right position for that. And listen... As we enter into that month, this is what I think we're up against. We are not going to be up against dealing with people who hate who we are or hate what we do or hate what we've done. People don't hate our church or hate our kids or hate our ministry, and I hope they don't hate me. At least I, I really hope that's not true. That's probably not going to be the issue the issue we will face is whether or not people really care. Whether you really care. That's the battle for Christians, it seems to me, that we all kind of have to wrestle with in our personal lives. As Christians, we don't necessarily battle with hate when it comes to the church. No, the question is, do we really care? Now, that question, it seems to me, comes alongside of another question. How much we care is, in fact, directly related to what we really believe. 
Some of us in this room are happy to say, I trust God when it comes to my uh, eternity. And yet we won't trust him with our expenses. We trust him, or so we say, to forgive us our sins, but so often we will not trust him when it comes to our finances. I want you to recognize that what you believe is going to impact and be demonstrated by what you really care about. Where your treasure is, Jesus said, there, there your heart will be. And so I ask you this morning, do you care and do you really believe? Now, why have I said that? Well, I want you to think about what the Apostle Paul has done in this passage. Paul is talking about the resurrection of Jesus. He is excited. He is on fire. He is waxing eloquent about the victory of God and the salvation he has given us. He says, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. We've won victory through Christ. Jesus is raised from the dead. And he says, death, where is your sting? He gives us victory through the Lord. And so he says to the church, stand firm, be immovable. And there is this crescendo of glory and awesomeness. And then Paul says, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Where did that come from? You know, we, we see it as a different chapter, but that's all together. There's no difference here. It, he went from this to that in a moment. And at first blush, it tremendously seems a little bit out of place. It's like anyone yesterday celebrate what the Guardians did in that 15th inning yesterday? Yeah, yeah. So here you are, the home run is hit, everybody celebrating, the high five and cheers going up, and somebody says, well, I think it's time to, to you know, balance my checkbook or something. It's just kind of out of place, it seems. Paul, here you are talking about the glory of the resurrection, and now you want to talk about the offering? But here's the point. Paul aimless or, or seemingly and effortlessly goes from this moment where he is talking about the resurrection because he believes it to talk about the offering because he believes in that too. Paul is demonstrating something powerful here. He's saying, because I believe Jesus is alive, I care about ministry. And I can afford to be generous because God has been extravagantly generous to me. And so I can give because he gave so that others will come to know how much he has given to. He says, blessed people give like God. And he says to the church, you are blessed. Now, I want you to think about this passage then, and in doing so, there are some principles in this passage that if you want to grow in Christ, and I hope you want to grow in Christ, we need to grow into as a part of our lives. And so notice this. First off, I will tell you this. Giving is an act of worship. Paul goes from this amazing moment of celebration of the resurrection to saying, now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So Paul has already given this instruction to another church. So this isn't a one and done sort of thing. This is how the churches are to operate. We should take a collection on the first day of every week, Paul says. And by the way, why the first day of every week? Well, the first day of every week is the, is the day when the church got together. And why are they getting together on the first day of the week? Because that's the Lord's day. The first day of the week is the day that Jesus was resurrected. And so suddenly we begin to see how this is all tied together. We have the resurrection, the Lord's day, the first day of the week, and worship and giving all tied together, Paul points out. The resurrection, God's bountiful gift of grace in life, is the motivation then that causes, to, causes us to say, I want to give. It's true. Uh, you know, in our church, you know, we haven't been passing the plate since before COVID. But it is right and proper that a church like ours take a collection, and we do that regularly. 
So giving is an expression then of our worship in response to all that God has done, namely the resurrection and the hope we have of eternal life. We worship because he's alive. And giving is a tangible way that we express our faith. God, you're alive. You've given me so much. You've given me hope for life eternal. My sins have been forgiven. I am promised heaven. And so what I have materially, I'm going to give to you because you have given so much to me. And so here's the question I want you to ponder. And it's really found in Psalm 116, verse 12. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? The King James Version says it this way, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? So notice this, that giving is not only an act of worship, but I think Paul points out rightly, it should be done regularly and proportionately. Paul writes, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up. Now, let me just stop there. He says, save some. Don't spend it all. And then you can give it. Now, let me say this is not legalistic here. Ooh, you have sinned if you didn't give a certain percentage. That's not what we're talking about here, although we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But Paul says, it ought to be, the amount I give ought to be in proportion to what I have brought in. He also says, I do it every day or every week. It ought to be regular. By the way, that means not just when I feel like it, because the reality is, I don't always feel like it. It's not just going to happen when I have more, because there are times when I won't have more. No, this is something we do as routine. You see, one of the areas, and I think this is one of those strongholds that we all have to kind of wrestle with in our life, and God wants to get a hold of, is the area of greed. It has power over many of us. One way to combat greed and train ourselves to think differently is to ask this very simple question. Are you ready? Why do I have so much. Why do I have so much? Because here's the question that we often have in the back of our minds. This is more of the question we often repeat to ourselves. Why don't I have more? Why not some more? That's the question we often wrestle with. But what if, what happens if we discipline ourselves in our lives to ask this other question, Lord, why do I have so much? A young woman brought her fiancé home to meet her mom and dad for Thanksgiving dinner. After dinner, dad uh, took the young man to his study to just kind of get to know him better. So the father says, so what are your plans, son? The son replied, well, I'm a biblical scholar. A biblical scholar, whom the, the father said, that, that's admirable, but what will you do to provide a, a nice and decent home for my daughter to live in? He said, well, I, I'm going to study, and God will provide for us. Well, how are you going to buy her an engagement ring? Again, the young man said, well, God will provide for us. And children, ask the father, how are you going to support the children? Don't worry, sir, God will provide. Well, the conversation went on and on like this for some time. Each time the father questioned, the young idealist would say that God would provide. Well, after the conversation was over, the mother went over to dad and asked, well, how did it go, honey? And the father answered, well, he has no job, he has no plans, and he thinks I'm God. <laughs> now that has nothing to do with my message but that was such a great story I thought I'd insert it right there but think about this what would change in our lives 
if we stop thinking about why don't I have more and start asking, God, why do I have so much? Listen, chances are, if you're in this room with me this, this morning, you probably have more than your parents did at their age. I suspect this is true if I look at this room, and no matter how you slice it, I know this to be true. We have more in this room than most of the population in this world by far. Why? Why do we have so much? When we feel like we don't have enough, we don't have a problem going to God and saying, can I have more? Can, can I have more? God, will you provide? Why can't I have more? Why is it then that when we have more than enough, more than most, we have such a difficulty going to the Lord and saying, Lord, why have you given me so much? We don't ask that question because in our culture, let's be honest this morning, we have this overwhelming tendency to spend everything we make. And so we have this idea that our lifestyle has to match our income. Or, let's face it, in many cases, our lifestyle exceeds our income. And so there are a host of people who have gotten themselves into tremendous debt. Christians have a difficult time with this. And so regardless of how much money you make, when you're under that stress because we leave no margin, we have no peace. And we're, we're frustrated, we're angry, we're disappointed. And this mindset of spending what we have is really allowing greed to take its root in our lives. And that moment we get a little bit more, we think, well, I can have a little bit more. And we never stop to think about what happens if we would take it a little bit slower and recognize, you know, well, if I have some extra, we give, but we never have any extra. And so we've decided I don't give at all. A lot of people right there this morning. Jesus. He told a story in the Gospel of Luke about a farmer who brought in a great crop. So Jesus says he tore his barns down to build bigger barns. And his conclusion was, this farmer said, I'm going to say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry." But you remember the end of that story. Jesus makes it clear. He says, but that night, his life was required of him. It turns out that man had it all wrong. The stuff he thought he owned wasn't his at all. He wasted his life. He wasted his opportunity to make a difference by building bigger barns. His life wasn't about to be, wasn't supposed to be about building bigger barns. It wasn't supposed to be about more leisure. And in the end, he had nothing, nothing, nothing. Why? Because he wasn't rich. He wasn't rich because he was never rich towards God. You see, the problem was he never asked the question. Why? Why, God, do I have so much? You ever thought about this? If a burglar came up to me this afternoon, and, and I'm out on Great Northern uh, at the mall, and a burglar says to me, Jeff, your money or your life, you must know my name, by the way, that's interesting, but <laughs> your, your money or your life, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give him the money, right? But if God comes to me and says, Jeff, and he does know my name, your money, or your life. What's our answer going to be? Andy Stanley had a lot of wisdom when he wrote these words. He said, remember what your mother told you when you had two cookies and your sister had none? 
quick, eat both of them before she gets her greedy hands on them? <laughs> Not if you had a good mom. She would say, share. I mean, think about it. What do we tell our own kids when they have more than they need and a friend or a sibling has absolutely nothing? We tell them, share. What, what happens if, if, if we're watching someone eat two cookies in the presence of someone who has none? Well, anyone in this room, it just doesn't seem right. So we feel compelled to say something, to do something. We begin to care. Imagine then. Imagine the world from God's perspective. Imagine God in heaven looking at our earth. He sees everybody in this world who has some cookies and some who don't. The greatest treasure, by the way, that we've ever been given is not clothes, is not food or shelter, all those, those things are necessary. But the greatest gift is the gospel message. And you think about it, there are people in Thailand, a ministry we support, or in Illyria or Slavic Village or right here in North Olmsted, people who have not been impacted by the gospel yet. In fact, in Paul's letter, his second letter to the church at Corinth, he challenges them again to be givers. And this is what he wrote. He was quoting a psalm when he said, God has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, but his righteousness endures forever. In other words, Paul was saying this, God has scattered plenty for the poor, for those who are materially poor, those who have not heard the gospel yet. He's scattered it in the hearts of those who are righteous, the righteous who, who have received and give and been given so much. And it is their opportunity then to spread that to them. But he says, I'm going to do it through my people. He has scattered his gifts to his people like you and me. And because his righteousness is happening in my life, I will be motivated to say, I can help. I can make a difference. And so if God has blessed you with more than you need, it's good to ask Christian, why? Now, I know that no one in this room would ever label themselves as greedy. But let me also say that greed is not a feeling. It's a refusal. It's a refusal to act. You see, you can feel compassion. You can feel compassion toward people. You can hope that they receive the gospel. You can hope they have food to eat. You can hope that they have a home to live in. You can hope that our church fulfills its goals. You can feel all that and still be as greedy as Scrooge. Why? Because all that feeling didn't do anything. It only does something when that feeling causes you to act. Greed is evidenced by, not by how you feel, but by what you are willing to do. I saw some of your examples of generosity this week. This uh, week we were able to deliver some items to that Ukrainian family. Uh, so, some uh, uh, opportunity, we had some furniture donated, some bedding, some uh, a couch. Uh, well, let's see, we had a stove and a refrigerator. We, of course, had given them a car the week earlier. We've really been able to make a, a sweet and honest connection, and thank you. Because some of you asked that question, well, God, why have you given this to me? I also want you to know that... You know, this is the time of year when we're getting ready for the congregational meeting. I'm thinking about trying to work with our finance team to set up a new budget for 2023. And we're realizing that we're about, right now, in real figures, about $32,000 behind where we should be in terms of expenses versus our income. Now, I think we can make that up. I believe we can with your help, but it's going to require your help to do that. We can't keep doing that or we're going to have to make some serious adjustments here very, very soon. And by the way, we are well aware inflation is high, gas is going up, stock market is way down. But some of us in this room maybe need to ask, are we giving 
according to our faith? Are we giving according to what we have received? You know, I've come to believe this, and I'm learning this still. It's very much a, a practice that God is still working in me. But my generosity ought to be impacted or, or, or ought to impact my overall lifestyle. In other words, if, if my level of generosity doesn't somehow pinch my lifestyle, I'm not really being generous. In other words, there ought to be things that I can't do because I decided to do something by giving to someone else. And, and if I can do everything that the neighbor next door who makes the same amount that I do does, then I haven't really been challenged in a generous way. And, and I see this is so important for us as Christians who desire to grow in this grace. The way we get there, it seems to me, is to become a percentage giver. This is that proportion. Give a proportion of your income. And and if you want to know where generosity starts in the Bible, it starts at 10%. We might call that the tithe. And I I just want to say, if that sounds way out for you, you don't have to start there. You don't have to start at 10%. Start at 2%. But start somewhere where you say, I want to grow in this, and this year I'm going to give 2%, 2.5%, maybe next year 3%. 4%. And as you develop a heart that's rich towards God, you'll be amazed and it'll actually become kind of fun. And you'll start asking, well, Lord, how can I be used? Why have you given this to me? What, what's the next step that we can do together? And some of us, and I've heard this, I don't trust the church with that much money. I don't trust the leadership with that much money. My answer is this. You find a church then where you trust the leadership with that much money. But don't hold back and refuse to grow in grace because that's what God's people do. It will be a habit that changes everything. It'll change the world. Listen, having money is not a problem. It's not a bad thing. It's not knowing why you have money that becomes the issue for so many Christians. So God, why have you given me so much? And by the way, if we believe God is alive, and Paul did, I hope you do, and if you ask him that question, (laughs) I think God might just give you the answer. If you're listening, are you willing to listen? May we be a church who says eagerly and often, oh God, why have you given me so much?